So, sorry, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Jude Colligan. I work at Ragmore in the um, respiratory ward, but also do respiratory outpatients and pulmonary rehab. Um, so, it says on the slides bronchiectasis, but what I'm going to talk about um, in this session and hopefully demonstrate is a little bit about the techniques that we might use for our respiratory patients to help them to clear their secretions from, from their lungs. Um, quite often we'll get people referred as an outpatient that maybe have had say, bronchiectasis or chronic lung disease for eight, nine years and had antibiotic after antibiotic, never really get into the bottom of their infections. But part of the management um, of these diseases is that the patients are taught adequate and effective airways clearance. Um, if they're just receiving the antibiotics, um, it clears up for a while, but in, unless they're actually um, get into the deeper seated secretions that are sat on the lungs, then they're not going to clear, clear the infections um, that are sitting there. So it's, it's part of, sort of the, the overall management of, of the disease process. Um, so hopefully over this session we'll, we'll teach you that um, physiotherapy isn't just take a deep breath and cough. Okay, there's, there's more to the techniques than that. And um, we'll cover a few different techniques. So one called autogenic drainage, which basically means self-drainage. Um, a technique called active cycle of breathing, which is a combination of, of techniques. And then we'll look at a few different adjuncts that we can add into sort of the management of our patients if the other techniques aren't effective. So the first one we're going to talk about is, is autogenic drainage. Um, and that's a technique that was developed by a Belgian physio um, called John Chevalier a number of years ago. Um, it's looking at um, breathing at the correct level, um, so depending on where the secretions are, we're wanting to focus the breathing techniques at that level. It's also looking at breathing at the right force for the patient, so that we're, we're aiming to maximise how we clear the airways, but without causing any constriction of the airways. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to pass everybody a tissue, not to cough up your sausage roll into, but um, just to demonstrate the technique. So I can pass those around, everyone grab a tissue and pass it on. Might take a while. <laughs> well, so are being passed on, basically there's a number of factors which influence airways clearance. Um, obviously we need adequate um, cilia mechanism. Um, so for, for normal individuals who don't have airway disease, we might cough and clear um, little bits of, of phlegm on a daily basis, but just swallow them. It doesn't really affect us. We don't really recognize it, but it's the natural response of the airways, the cilia mechanism to waft um, any sort of irritants um, from the chest. Um, we're also looking at um, the normal um, airways, the nature of the airways. So in chronic lung disease, um, sometimes the airways can become um, uh, collapsible, uh, they lose the elastic recoil. Um, so as you're trying to f force the breath to clear secretions, um, the airways actually close down and becomes more difficult to clear the secretions. So that is when we would maybe add in some of our adjuncts to help to open up the airways a little bit more so we get more adequate um, airways clearance, but we'll come on to that um, in a wee while. So autogenic drainage is a combination of techniques. As I say, we're, we're looking at um, initially, because I can borrow the tissues now, we're looking at how we um, breathe out. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate and then I'll get you all to have a wee practice. So if I was to hold uh, a tissue in front of me, okay, if I get you all to force the breath out as hard as you can onto the tissue. So you're holding the tissue out at arm's length, okay? So slow breath in and a... <laughs> okay, so some of you get a little bit of movement of the tissue, but there's not a huge amount of movement going on. So basically, if you force the, or force the air too much, you're, not, you're going to slow down, you're going to squeeze the airways, and you're not going to get as much airflow through the secretions. Okay? If I was to cough on the tissue, <laughs> again, not much movement of the tissue. So what we're aiming to teach when we're teaching the patient's airways clearance is they're breathing out with enough force that they're going to move the secretions, but without causing airways collapse. So we need to modify the flow so you get more adequate um, clearance of the secretions. If I hold out at arm's length again, I'm going to take a slow breath in, and as I breathe out this time, I'm going to breathe out as if I'm trying to steam up a mirror or a window. So keeping your mouth open and tongue sort of pressed down on the bottom of the mouth, which opens up the back of the throat. So it's a Okay. 
<laughs> so try again. So what you'll see is more movement of the tissue, okay? So we've got a little bit slightly more forceful than normal, but not a full force. We're getting more movement of the tissue, which means there's more airflow through the secretions um, on the chest to help with our airways clearance, okay? What that means to the patient, I mean, obviously, when, when we're teaching the clearance techniques, we're getting the patient to listen out for any crackling, which will tell them where the secretions are. And this is why taking a deep breath and coughing doesn't always um, work for our patients. So if you take a deep breath, cough, they might clear the secretions higher up on the airways. But if they're hyperinflated, so if their they're shoulders are up here, the chest is up here, they're never actually going to get the air down to the bottom of, of the lungs to shift the secretions. So that is where we might use sort of hands-on treatment to try and help to bring the patient's chest to, down a wee bit to get them breathing down sort of lower lung volumes um, to help to shift the secretions. So we'd start off with the breathing technique first of all. So we'd get them with that breath, breathing out as far as they can, so trying to empty the lungs and just doing like a searching breath. So they're listening out for where the crackling is within the airways, um, which will tell them where the secretions are. And we're getting them to breathe sort of normal breaths but in and out through that crackle. Gradually that crackle position will, will raise so that once the crackle's at the beginning of the breath out, then the patient can cough and clear. But you get a number of, of patients that will cough, 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 nothing comes up. It's not that the chest is, is clear, it's just that the secretions are deeper down on the chest and we're not managing to shift them. So that's where the hands-on um, treatment would come. So if I can borrow her model, borrow Michelle just now, if that's okay. <laughs> Not for the belly. <laughs> I'll grab a chair for you there. <laughs> okay, can't do that now. <laughs> so, what we might do when we're assessing the patient, okay, so you talk a patient with a um, hyperinflated chest, okay, we might put our hands onto the rib cage, and from an assessment point of view, we get Michelle to take a slow breath in in through your nose and then breathe out and you're breathing out and trying to empty the lungs as much as you can and then initially what we might do is put a little bit of force onto the rib cage we're taking her down <laughs> <laughs> how's the sausage rolls <laughs> i didn't have any <laughs> didn't have any okay okay sorry ashley spits out a sausage roll or two okay so slow breath in all the way down so pressure on the rib cage so out, out as far as you can Okay, and putting a little bit of pressure on, so we're trying to maximise how far the patient is breathing out. So we're trying to get down to the deeper seated secretions that might sort of sit at the, the periphery. Okay, once uh, we feel we've got to the maximum, we would keep the pressure on, on inhalation. So we we're stopping Michelle, if Michelle was to take a deep breath in now, we'd keep the pressure on, get to, but hold the pressure on. So we're restricting how far Michelle would breathe in. Okay, and then we let go on the breath out, but you're, do, you're going to do your forced breath out, so you're not yeah, on camera. So lovely when you take your okay, hands so. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so slow breath in. Okay, and hold the breath and then breathe out. Okay, so obviously Michelle hasn't got any problems with her chest, so <laughs> not hearing anything. But what we're listening out for the whole time is any crackling within the airways, which will tell us where the secretions will be sitting. Okay, so you, here there, Michelle breathed out a little bit too hard, so you're starting to hear a little bit of a wheeze. Okay, so then we'd modify the breath out with the patient. The other thing we can try if we're getting a wheeze is um, on the breath in, we get the patient to take um, hold the breath for a few seconds. This allows the collateral ventilation to open up, which allows the air to get in and behind the secretions so that we can help to shift them. Okay. So depending on where the infection is, depends on maybe where we, where we put the pressure or what position we might treat the, treat the patient in. For, for some of our um, sort of chronic chests, um, a good, good position we get into, so you, you're stopping the hyperinflation, you're um, giving some compression around the outside of the chest, so we might sit behind the patient, pop our hands at the top here and give some pressure so we're squeezing down the airways just so we're trying to maximise um, getting them to the end of expiration and what we call low lung volume breathing so we're trying to clear the secretions from the bottom part of the, the chest okay so um, the whole time we're sort of modifying we're listening out for wheeze we're listening out for crackles and it's basically it's retraining the patient the proprioception of the chest so they're trying to, to work out where the secretions are so that they can listen to that and get that feedback when they're doing their airways clearance at, at home um, 
Sometimes they say you'll get patients that will cough, 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 and it, it's not that there's nothing there, it's just it's not up high enough. So we would, we'd want really to train them to um, have a productive cough only. So if, um, Michelle, we're taking her down to low lung volumes, the stuff sat there, the lining of the lungs, it sort of irritates the lining of the lungs, it causes her to cough, but we know that the crackles at the end of the breath out, so we're not actually going to clear anything at the moment. Um, so what we want to try and get Michelle to do is to swallow, take wee sips of water to suppress the cough. So it's only really when the, the crackles are up in the upper airways will the cough be productive. So you know yourself that some of our patients, they'll be <coughs> coughing and coughing. It uses up quite a lot of energy when they're coughing and it's just going to, if it, the secretions are up or so down too, too low, all it's going to do is push them back down onto the chest a little bit further. Okay, you're dismissed. That's That's fine. Fine. <laughs> okay. So once we've established that, it may well be that um, the, the breathing part of the technique's adequate. It may well be that the patient needs some hands-on um, therapy. Um, if they do need that extra assistance to get down to lower lung volumes, then that's where you might see some of your patients with the belts that we use. No, anyone? <laughs> no. Okay, Lynn, sorry, can I borrow you a second? <laughs> okay, so rather than the hands-on, could be the bane of my life. <laughs> okay, so we need you to pop that on. So if you've got underneath your arm pits there. Okay, so what we would get the patient to do is to breathe out as far as they can. Okay, so breathe out first. And then we're tightening the belt as tight as we can around the rib cage. Okay. So that's fine, you can stay standing. So um, what will happen then is um, as a patient breathes in, Okay, the belt will um, restrict them here, so not be able to, to breathe up here, so not hyperinflating, but it will hold them down at that low lung volume, um, so you can kind of automatically mobilise the secretions from, from the periphery um, and help to, to clear. Um, some of you will be aware, of, obviously, years gone by, we'd use the postal drainage, the percussion, and, and this. The, the good thing about this technique is it is kind of user-friendly, so for some of our younger patients, we might get them to pop the belt on in the morning, do what they have to do for sort of half an hour or so, and then sit down and do the breathing elements of the technique. Because with the belt on, with them moving around, they're automatically um, mobilising um, or breathing down at lower lung volumes and mobilising secretions that are maybe sat deeper down on the chest. So it just means they'll get a more effective um, clearance um, when they're, they're using that. Okay, we're dismissed now. <laughs> no, that. Okay, so that's, that's one technique, so that's autogenic drainage, um, and we use it a lot in bronchi exorcists. We'll, we'll use it in some of our COPDs as well. Um, we'll just have to be careful and modify sort of hands-on pressure for, for patients that are uh, maybe osteoporotic. Um, some patients that may be prone to anxiety obviously don't necessarily like the restriction that, that the belt feels on their chest, but, but we have had some success with patients where we maybe just um, gently attach the belt and then gradually increase the pressure as, as they feel comfortable. Okay, um, next techni technique and one that's sort of commonly um, muttered is sort of active cycle of breathing technique. Um, so that's a combination of um, sort of breathing control, thoracic expansion exercises, um, uh, FET or forced expiratory technique or a huff. Um, and you can use it and incorporate it with positioning as, as well. So um, for breathing control, um, it used to be called um, your diaphragmatic breathing, what we're getting the patients to do. Again, not very good after lunch, but if I get you all to pop your hand just on the top of your tummy there. Okay. And sometimes what I do, I'll get a patient to pop a hand just on the top of the chest, not on the microphone. <laughs> okay. So you want the hand just to sit just on, on the top of, top of the tummy there. Okay. The hand at the top is mainly just so the patient can feel that this part of the chest shouldn't be moving when we're taking a breath in, okay? Most of the um, function should happen down at the, the bottom of the chest. Um, so what I'd avoid is sort of phrases like deep breathing exercise. As soon as you say take a deep breath, automatically the patients will hyperinflate. So we're asking them to take a slow breath in, okay? As they breathe in, they're trying to allow the tummy to move forward. Okay, so as the tummy moves forward, that allows the diaphragm to drop down and allows you to breathe from lower down on the chest. 
So this can be used as part of sort of airways clearance, but it can also be used for trying to um, control the breathing um, if the patient's breathless as well. Okay, so they're focusing the attention away from the shoulders and down to the, the diaphragm. Okay. And it may be that they would do sort of three or four breaths <coughs> in one sequence. Okay. Then we've got thoracic expansion or deep breathing exercises, um, and that is where we're focusing the attention on the, the lower part of, of the rib cage. Okay. Um, so we can get a patient to pop hands just onto the rib cage, back both sides. Again, if they're frail, if they've got arthritic problems, it might be more difficult to do that. Um, so we, we might be able to get a patient just to pop the hand just on the side there, so just focusing on one side of the rib cage as, as they do this. We're putting a little bit of pressure onto the rib cage, so just giving yourself a little bit of feedback. And as they take a breath in this time, what you want them to try and concentrate on is, is pushing the ribs out into the hands. Okay, so slow breath in again. See, and it's not, so some of them will, will bend over so that the ribs are moving out, but it's, it's the breathing and the expansion of the lungs that we're trying to focus on. So um, hands onto the outside of the ribs, slow breath in. <laughs> okay. And so we're about three or four breaths like that. Um, and then the other part of the technique is what's called a forced expiratory technique. So that's similar to what we showed you with the tissue. Um, we were, if the secretions are up quite high, we can force with a little bit more force and um, you'll, you'll shift the upper secretions. If the secretions are lower down, then we want to modify and breathe out to sort of a, a lower lung level to shift the, the lower secretions. Um, the, some, I don't know if anyone's got the peak flow tubes left from this morning. So Sometimes if your patient can't get the hang of the, the forced expiration, uh, we would sometimes use a peak flow tube the opposite way around from this morning. So you were using it for expiratory flow rather than inspiratory flow. Okay, I'm um, getting to patient. Sorry? I know, but we can do it out because it's a long way. So I practiced, <laughs> I tried it at lunchtime, it does work. So we get a slow breath in. Okay, and then we're mouth around the tube and blowing out with a little bit of force. So automatically with the tube in the mouth, the tube will press down the tongue, which opens up the back of the throat, allows them to get a more adequate airflow to shift the secretions. So for some of it, even with some of the patients that maybe can't follow the instructions for, for standard techniques, um, some of our dementia patients, sometimes even, even just giving them a peak flow tube and practicing the breathing through the peak flow tube without the valves in it, um, will um, give them a sort of adequate airways clearance from that perspective. Okay. Um, for some of our um, more chronic chests, I mentioned about airways collapsing. Um, so some of our COPDs, um, maybe they've lost the elastic recoil. We can't get an adequate force without causing airways collapse. That's when we might add in some of our adjuncts. Um, so you may well have seen some of these devices floating around. Um, <clears throat> these are what we call sort of oscillatory PEP devices. So PEP meaning that they give a little bit of positive pressure which helps to keep the airways open. Okay, so for the patients that are wheezy it would help to keep the airways open for a little bit longer so you can breathe out further and mobilise the, the peripheral secretions. Um, but they also have an oscillatory factor um, and depending on the device depends on how that works. Um, but what will happen is um, the device will rattle as uh, your patient's breathing out. Um, that will then help to rattle along the airways, mobilise any of the secretions that are sticking um, and help to bring them up into the upper airways so the patient can, can cough and clear. So, can I borrow somebody else as a guinea pig? No. <laughs> okay. So this is um, sort of a... Uh, Oscillatory. <laughs> this is an oscillatory PEP device. Um, used to be called a flutter. Uh, different companies taken over the licenses. Um, now a license is a Pario PEP, um, but principles are the same. It's a wee bit of plastic, plastic pipe. There's a cone section which will sit within that. There's a ball bearing which will sit on top, and then the wee gadget on there. The main thing with this is obviously when the patient's using it. 
Um, they want to make sure they've not got their fingers over the holes there, otherwise it's going to lose effect. Um, drawback with this one, um, you have to, it is position dependent, um, so you have to hold it horizontally or slightly tilted up or slightly tilted down and we get the patients to play around with the positioning of that until they get um, uh, adequate um, function of the device and the way they, they're listening out for that sort of rattling of the ball within the device if you tilt it up too much it doesn't rattle if you tilt it down too much it doesn't rattle so it's just working out which which angle is um, best for your your patient okay so um, we can get a patient sitting upright in the chair um, with support um, and hold on to the device okay again as I say fingers away from the front of that I'm going to take a slow breath in for your nose and then if you blow out with a little bit of force through the device. So I don't know if you can hear that. So we're slightly more muffled there, so what Kareem might need to do is just tilt the device up slightly. So again, a little bit muffled, so you want to tight tilt it slightly down slightly. So what we're rather than doing like a full force to begin with, which uh, a lot of folk do, um, we want to breathe out with a little bit of force, okay, but not a full force. Um, and that will help, um, with, the, with those breaths, that will help to bring the secretions up from lower down into sort of the upper airways. So, <laughs> they were... <laughs> <laughs> your, your asthma. Um, so what we're wanting, wanting to try and do um, when, they, when they breathe out as well um, is it would about five or ten breaths like that so that's slightly more force than normal but not a full force okay once once they've done that they want to maybe do a couple of breaths with a slightly bit more force than that and those are the evacuation breaths and the stuff that will, will bring the, the secretions up um, a little bit higher but um, we've got patients who might be wheezy. Um, it's quite difficult to, to do airways clearance because um, anything that we do which involves force of the airways makes them a little bit more wheezy. So sometimes we would add this into their treatment management plan and um, a lot of our patients find it um, really effective um, and sort of probably one of the best tools that, that they would use. Okay, so that's a flutter device. Okay. We've got an a cappella next. Um, so here we've got sort of mouthpiece. You want to do this one too or someone else? Um, inside this is a wee bit of plastic and a magnet. And basically um, when you breathe out through this device, it's the piece of um, plastic which vibrates, which then vibrates along the airways. Okay, one good thing about this one is it isn't position dependent. Um, so if you've got somebody that's maybe struggling to um, get the right angle um, with, with other um, devices, um, then it doesn't really matter with this one which position you hold it into, it will still function. I'm told if it stops functioning, it should be held this way up. Uh, if you turn it upside down, it, it functions, um, functions better after a while. Um, so with this one again, we're making sure we don't put the fingers over the, the section at the end. We're a slow breath in and then mouth around the mouthpiece and breathing out with a little bit of force. Okay, one thing to watch, so Kareen's doing it perfectly, but some of your patients, have, the cheeks might rattle as they breathe out, which means that some of the effects of the device will be absorbed within the mouth and not actually get down onto the chest. So um, what we quite often tell, tell folk to do is, is um, have a mirror in front of them when they're practicing at home so they try and minimize the amount of movement from, from the cheeks. Okay. Um, we also have to make sure our patients clean them out afterwards. Um, we <laughs> do tell them, um, but sometimes they will come in and there's all kinds of things growing inside them. So um, they should be cleaned on a daily basis. Um, the device can be taken apart for, for all these devices and rinsed in hot soapy water and then left to towel dry. Um, and they can deep, deeper clean them on a weekly basis. Um, that one. And then we've also got a sort of MediFlow. Um, this can be used for um, inspiration and on expiration as well. Um, so if we're using it for our expiratory PEP device, um, we're using the top uh, connector. If we're using it for inspiration or incentive spirometry, we would ha use the bottom connector there. Um, so again, we're getting the patient to take a slow breath in. Um, the ball would rise up, okay, as um, 
the patient, or sorry, as the patient's breathing out through the device. Um, and this gives, again, a little bit of resistance, which helps to keep the airways open. <laughs> sorry. Okay, again you can change the resistance on this, so we'd start off with a low resistance and we gradually increase the resistance um, depending on how a patient's um, able to manage it. Things we're looking out for is what we don't want to do is increase the work of breathing, so make the patient more breathless. Um, so we may modify the length of time they're using the, the device for, um, we may incorporate it with other techniques as well. Um, and. Um, as I say, we, we might incorporate positioning into what we're doing from a, a management perspective as well. Um, so with, with that in mind, we'll, we'll come on to just looking at a few different positions. If your patient's breathless, a few different positions that might help. Um, I don't know if you want to do it here or sit down. <laughs> you can sit down. No, it's fine. Sit down. Okay, so um, we'll talk about, we've talked about breathing control. Um, what we might do... Um, with a breathing control is used slightly different positions to help from a, a breathing perspective. Um, so sitting with your back resting on the chair, as say we've, we've talked about sort of breathing from the tummy, so that's a good position to, to help from that perspective. Sometimes we might get the patients to um, pop their hands placed upwards on the lap, okay? That's encouraging them to drop the shoulders, okay? So it allows the breathing to settle down a little bit more quickly, moving in through the nose. Okay, some of our patients you'll find um, will adopt a forward leaning position. I would sort of find patients that would use that, yeah. So um, you've all got tables in front of you. I don't know if you want to put the tables across. Okay, so in the forward leaning position, okay, um, we're giving support to the shoulders. We're allowing the patient to lean forwards. Um, we're allowing the tummy to, to move forwards, which gives the lungs a little bit more room to expand. So it just helps to um, settle the breathing down more quickly. We can use it on its own with the table. We can maybe put a couple of cushions on it. Sometimes we'll get the patient um, with the, the cushions and the head on the side um, and just um, get them to relax in that position. Some of our patients will sleep in that position because they find it more comfortable than, than lying down. Um, if we haven't got the table, then we can adopt a sort of forward leaning. Um, this. <laughs> so forward leaning, arms resting onto the lap in that position. Okay. So again, in that position, we're giving support to the shoulders. The tummy's forward, gives the lungs a little bit more room to expand. So not no one technique uh, works for everybody, but it's just having a catalogue of techniques that we can use with our patients depending on, on their condition. Okay, if they were up and about and walking and um, became breathless, um, then we could um, <coughs> use sort of forward leaning on a work surface, um, forward leaning on a banister. Um, sometimes if they're out in town, there's not many chairs, um, we would maybe get them um, leaning with a back against the wall, plenty of pillars in the Eastgate Centre. Um, back against the wall, back supported, arms resting by the side and in that position um, just giving them some, some support until they've allowed the breathing to settle down more quickly. So I have to say that was a real, that was a brilliant session and I must admit I felt a wee bit anxious. I'm going to talk to you a bit about anxiety and I'm we really well versed on it because I have to say listening to James's talk there he's definitely I'm going to duplicate lots of his slides and so my anxiety levels were, were raised significantly I have to say so I'm, I'm talking the talk and I'm walking the walk today so really we've heard lots of really clever stuff all morning it's been a great day I hope you'll agree we're really going to finish on the practical stuff. So practical things that you can do in your practice to take away with you today. And, and we're going to have a bit of a practice as well. So be prepared to get up and move about a wee bit too, which will not do any of us any harm, will it? What are our common respiratory causes? We're just going to gloss over these, but COPD, bronchiectasis, pulmonary fibrosis, and chronic asthma. There's no surprises there. The things that we're going to talk about today though as well, I, I hope that actually we'll be able to apply them in, in lots of cases of chronic respiratory breathlessness. Um.
um, across the board, so we're, we're certainly not exclusive there. From my point of view, I really like to be able to see what I'm kind of dealing with. I have to hold my hands up and say anatomy and physiology was never my strong point in, in nursing college um, at all. My colleagues would completely agree with me there. So I really like to be able to visualise just what that person um, is experiencing as well and what's, what, what are the cause of their symptoms. So nothing better than our basic slides then really describing our, our airways in COPD, which you know really need very little explanation. We can see very well the, that level of obstruction that we've heard about all through the day. We can see how that's probably going to make somebody symptomatically breathless. Um, and we're, we're going to recognise that then. So I sort of, I suppose I go around with these pictures in my head and then apply it to the person in front of me. In emphysema, it's, it's a bit different. It's still certainly a condition of the airways. So what we're seeing in emphysema is much more that picture of air trapping. So they can, they can breathe the air in, that's fine, but it's actually the challenge in our patients with emphysema is to actually be able to exhale and get that breath back out again. So that's what we're, we're going to focus on that and certainly in some of our some of the exercises that we're going to go through because people will say that to you, I just want a breath in. That's what people, that's really their key motivator. They just want to get that big breath in. So hopefully we're going to go over some ways that you're going to allow people to do that or enable people to do that. I like this slide here, which sort of just really shows that the destruction in the alveoli up the end of the airways and it seems to make sense. Somebody told me, I think maybe some one of the consultants or somebody really clever will, um, will agree or not. If we laid out our alveoli, the, the surface of that alveoli, if we laid it out flat, it would cover a tennis court. That's quite enormous, isn't it? That's a huge area of, of tissue that's waiting there just for the gas exchange, breath in and out. It's an enormous area of potential activity, breathing in and out. But I think you can see there that over the, over the course of people having emphysema, the tissue becomes destroyed, it becomes thinner, the elastic is just not there. It's almost, it's like that tissue on the back of your hands. You remember when you were 17, we've got a lot of young people in the audience. Remember when you were 17 and you did that and it pinged back and it was lovely and all was good with the world. Do you remember these days? <laughs> I know, certainly from mine, uh, yeah, as the big 5 all comes, it's just not pinging back now, which is a bit miserable, but never mind. But that, the, exactly the same process really is happening in our lungs. But when we, do, when we do things that annoy our lungs, that accelerate that process, probably smoking being the predominant one, accelerates it and the tissue becomes destroyed and we're much more likely then to have that air trapped in our lungs. Again, I just really like to have that visual. I think it's good to connect the two. Where's James Towers, honestly? So your slides were so much more professional and academic. <laughs> so here we are. We have this therapy, we have this intervention, which absolutely the, the, Cochrane, um, the Cochrane body have said, do you know what, you don't need to study this, this intervention anymore. It works so well, it is just one of the best therapies. After stopping smoking, there's nothing else as efficient that we can do for these people who are chronically breathless. So what is it? It, it reduces anxiety levels hugely it, consistently when we measure um, it, it shown to reduce anxiety levels increases people's confidence i think crucially it reduces hospital admissions and exacerbations now that's huge um, james showed figures there around about reducing hospital admissions for every bed day i think is around about 600 pounds i think per bed day per simple bed day without any um, fancy interventions. So actually if we can do that, that's brilliant isn't it? It increases exercise tolerance, people can do more and it improves quality of life. So what is it? He's kind of gave the answer away. <laughs> Pulmonary rehab, isn't it? It's just brilliant. Pulmonary rehabilitation is should be the kind of bedrock I suppose of that we're offering to all of these people. Up here we've got, I, I just I love the positive pictures here. Who would be, can I, I haven't really planned this, can I take a show of hands? Who would be confident if you had someone in front of you in clinic consultation, who would be confident to explain to them actually what pulmonary rehab was? Just a show of hands. 
and that's that's absolutely as we would expect and and i suppose what we've got here in this room is a group of enthusiasts as well so who are already who have that interest in respiratory as a percentage it, it's it's fairly um, awful i think so this therapy which you know james told you about re reduces healthcare costs increases quality of life we know it does this what percentage of people who would benefit from that therapy do you think are actually referred and go through? Just shout it out. What percentage? 50? Hmm. Any advances on 50? 5%. Five. Five well, that's a, that's a wee bit pessimistic. Okay, so that, but that's good. That's, that's good. There's about 10%. It's between 8 and 10%. Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland did a big survey last year in Scotland and they found it was 8%, which is pretty rubbish, isn't it? For a therapy that does all these things, it's, it's brilliant. Our numbers needed to treat are so small. But actually, I think that you, that's the answer because we don't really understand what it is. And I, I have to hold my hand up and say I worked across in the chest unit for about 12 years. And I knew that Jude, our physiotherapists, our brilliant physiotherapists, used to disappear on a Tuesday morning and a Thursday morning and still my way to this pump. I said, well, what, what's that about? And it wasn't until I escaped into the community that I sort of take myself off and went to a class. And it's just, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. So I suppose, this is not a talk about pulmonary rehabilitation, by the way, but I just wouldn't get away with talking about activity without it. I would really commend it to you to go along to your local class. We're fairly fortunate in NHS Highland. We've got classes in Inverness, Caithness, Sky, Sutherland. So we're, we're fairly fortunate. We still don't have nearly enough of it. And maybe we need to look at how, how we actually give that to people. Maybe we have to think about doing more home-based things or doing it in the community a bit more. But certainly, yeah, I would commend it to you. So this is, again, duplication. But do you know, it's good. I sat, my heart sank a wee bit when I saw your slide. But then, actually, I'm quite an optimist. And I thought, do you know, it doesn't think because, what do we focus on when we think about breathlessness? I don't know about anybody. I feel like the queen of Oromorph sometimes. I feel I should be on commission for whoever it is that makes Oromorph. Because that's just what I talk about all the time. We, we really like to be able to someone in front of us who is breathless and we really like to write that prescription don't we and and do something very tangible and we like to be able to prescribe things and actually quite often what we need to do is is go back to the the basics there and and move away from the the pharmacological aspect i think so, so and i think reinforcement and repetition is quite good as well so i was delighted to see james on that slide Breathlessness is really, it's complicated, isn't it? Do you find that in your own practice? I, you know, for years, um, we talk, we was working with cancer patients, we used to talk about pain as what the patient says it is. And I think we're quite bought into that now, aren't we? We're very, you know, we listen to people. And breathlessness is very much the same, isn't it? It needs to be what the person, what you're seeing in front of you and what, it, what the impact is it has on people's lives. Because absolutely that person exists who has an F. I can think of one chap um, who, over the last couple of years, I saw him, who's got an FEV1 of 23%. But he's the main carer for his wife who had a um, chronic Parkinson's disease. And so he used to be away up doing, he could do the shopping, he could carry two bags of shopping, fairly substantial bags of shopping. And yet he's got an FEV1 of 23%. So on paper, it looks rubbish. But actually, he's doing that. He was doing all the housework needed to be persuaded to get home care in and all that kind of stuff. But then and you'll all know the person whose lung function is much, much higher, who really shouldn't be symptomatic at all and yet is very symptomatic. And that breathlessness is as real to the, it's, it's a real thing. So it's very subjective, isn't it? The other phrase that sticks in my head, I've kind of talked to a couple of times over the past few months about breathlessness and we did some work I'm doing some work with Mary up north in Caithness and we looked at some of the out of hours reports you know for people being admitted and on some of them it would say breathlessness and anxiety and then when you spoke to people and say so what was it was that an exacerbation no it was just breathlessness and anxiety and it was that word I don't know what you think of that word it was just breathlessness and anxiety 
I don't know, a wee show of hands again, has anybody ever been breathless and anxious? Yeah, would, it, would you have described it as just breathlessness and anxiety? It's pretty awful, isn't it? So actually, do we have to then start thinking in terms of, because I'm sure lots of people, actually when we've gone over the paperwork, I'm sure lots of these people who have been admitted into the acute hospital, it will say an exacerbation of COPD, but in actual fact, it's probably that breathlessness and anxiety that's been a huge factor in getting to that point. So it would be really good for us to be able to start coming to terms with that and getting to grips with it. So I love this model. It's really based on work done by the Cambridge Breathlessness Intervention Service down in Cambridge. And I would commend their website too. It's brilliant for resources, for patient leaflets, etc. And really they think about that. So we've looked at that, the physiology, how we've looked at the breathing, we've looked at the, the increased work that the, the person has to do to reduce that hyperinflation of the lungs, to get past the, the obstruction. The person is going to have to be doing more work. They'll be possibly using the accessory muscles. It's harder work, isn't it? If it's hard work and it, it, the breathlessness becomes unpleasant, then what do we normally do when we encounter that breathlessness? What do we do naturally? Any answers? Breathe more shallow. We breathe, we definitely breathe more shallow. Our breathing starts to change, but, but what, how does our behaviour change? Uh, let's think, we, we've been going to the co-op, okay, and you know, we, we meet our neighbours, but we meet our neighbours and we're, we're having to just struggle and maybe lean against the wall. What do we want to do about that as people? exert ourselves less, we probably want to avoid it, don't we? As human beings, we're really good. Our, you know, we've evolved really cleverly to avoid threats and danger, haven't we? And that's great. In the time when there was bears, you know, around about, that was brilliant. We would be avoiding the threat of, of these. But that becomes a threat to our, our comfort, I suppose, and we very quickly then start to avoid these threats. And the way that we avoid them is by, by doing less. And that's where that, that kind of vicious circle, doesn't it, come in, where the function in there, because we do less. And you, you'll see it with people all the time. Their people's world fairly quickly becomes much narrowed, doesn't it? It becomes really quite small, unless we can help and work in partnership with them to, to reverse that. But, but fairly quickly, people's world becomes small when they start to avoid these things. We have a lady who I always think of um, out in Dingwall, and she, she worked in one of the big supermarkets and was one of these well-kent faces. And we said, you know, what, what were your goals? And she just wanted to go to the bingo, but she'd stopped going and talking to anybody because she was so scared she'd go around Tesco's. And because she was on these well-known faces, everybody would stop and speak to her. But she was so embarrassed by that breathlessness that she just very quickly, in the course of having exacerbations, she just stopped doing that. And it, her world became so narrowed very quickly. And that, we see that all the time, unfortunately. So the thinking, the, the three really, we can't separate them. We can never separate the, what goes on up here as to what goes on physically. And our thing, it's that sort of threat to our, our comfort that we, that we start to, that becomes real. And it is real because we went to the co-op and we became breathless. And so, well, not doing that again. And we, we tell ourselves that that's what's happened. So, so we need to really think of them all together. So... What practical things help? Pace and activity, that's, like, that's a huge thing, isn't it? And I think, I don't know, and I'm not being sexist, but I think women find it much more difficult sometimes than men because they've always been used to doing all the housework in you know, one morning or, or one day, and then they become so frustrated, they're just not able to do the same things. So pace and activity is huge. But positioning, and we'll see people doing that all the time, people have the tripod position, they adopt the tripod position, don't they? They lean on a wall or they, you'll see them, people will say, oh, it's fine going around Tesco's because they'll have the shopping trolley. So that support of their shoulder girdle really matters. I guess after being the queen of Oromorph, I felt a, bit, a couple of weeks ago like the queen of the rollator frames because rollator frames are really good for being able to give them that support and support the short, shoulder girdle. Try saying that. So that's, that's really useful. Handheld fan, who's, who's heard of the handheld fans? Yeah. Have you used them? 
absolutely brightly. James mentioned oxygen and again work done by Sarah Booth down in Cambridge showed that the, the handheld fan, when we direct it to our face and we put the, the flow of air down the side of our nose and our face here, it can be as effective as the, a, a blast of oxygen. And it works in the same way, really. It works, it invokes our diver's response or the response, you know, when you're a newborn baby and if you threw the newborn baby into a swimming pool, it would, it would swim, it would hold its breath and it would survive. So it's the same response as that. So the fans are brilliant. And again, they, they stimulate the trigeminal nerve down here. I can't really tell you the clever stuff in behind that, what part of the brain it works in or whatever, but, but it works really well to the point of we had a chap a couple of months ago and we, he had fibrosis and we thought oxygen might help. But he never ever went for the oxygen, but his fan was, it was always with him. He kept his fan in his pocket and that really got him out of, of trouble sometimes. So the handheld fan, you get them in chemists, you get them in boots, um, Amazon, in these places. I think the beauty of it is you don't have to be, you know, doing, it's not special. You can have it in your pocket. It's available any time, so, so the hand for, there's lots of really good evidence to suggest that that's good. Purse-lit breathing. I think we all um, maybe do that sometimes. Some people adopt it naturally anyway, so we'll have a wee show of doing that in a while. And blow as you go. Actually, we're going to do that just now. I learned that. <laughs> no, you are? Yeah, you put me in the spot earlier. <laughs> Blow as you go works because I, I you know, you think, right, I have to, I tell people this all the time, I actually will do it, so I was putting a big uh, thing of logs away a couple of months ago, and I got done in about, I don't know, a third of the time or something, because I blew as you go. So we're going to have a wee practice of this, okay, you look as if you could do with moving. What do we normally do, right, I need you to think about this, okay, what people say would make them more breathless is sometimes if they were bending down, so what they'll do is they'll bend down and, oh, and they feel quite breathless then when they come back up. Or let's say they're reaching up to, for the washing line or something. So that exertion can just knock the stuffing from them. And if it knocks the stuffing from them, what do they do? What's the risk that they do? They don't do it. They avoid it. So what we're going to do, what I want you to do is just practice how you would do it normally. I'm sorry, you've all got tables and papers in front of you and ever. But what I want you to do is just bend down to your toes, okay? And think about what, think about how you're breathing when you're doing it. And then come back up quickly. <laughs> Stop laughing. <laughs> Did you hold your breath? Is everybody aware of that, that you held your breath in as you were doing that? Okay, okay. Right, so... And that's, what, that's fine, you're all, listen, we're all a, we're a fit bunch in here, aren't we? It's all fine. But actually, you can imagine if you're um, currently breathless, that's not so good. So what we try and tell people, and it's a challenge, because this is, people have breathed this way all their lives. That's the biggest challenge, I think, when breathlessness um, management. You've done this all your life, and don't try and tell me how to do it. So we're trying to change a big habit. So what we're going to ask you to do this time is, as you're bending down to your toes, I'm going to get you to blow as you're using that exertion, so like this. Okay, try that. So as you're exerting yourself, you'll exhale. How did that feel? Is it better? Is it easy to, to get the pattern? It's not at all easy, is it, to sort of to relearn that? It's a lovely way thing to get people to practice and supposing it's putting things up into that cupboard so that's the as you're going off to do it and it just helps sorry is that okay yeah so it's a lovely thing to practice but blow as you go that's it's an easy one to remember and I think that's the beauty of it isn't it rectangular breathing we're going to go and talk about that purse lip recovery breathing do we all kind of we'll all see people doing it all the time what I want you to do is I want you to take a breath in and then just breathe out normally. And what I want you to do is think about the, think about the tension that's inside your chest. Okay, so take a breath in, breathe out normally. And breathe out normally. 
quite easy? Okay. So do you remember when we looked at the picture of the damaged alveoli and all these air sacs in there are damaged? So, so really what we want to do is we want to prevent the airways there from collapsing. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a breath in and then breathe out. What I want you to do when you're breathing out like that, think about the, is there, does it feel a bit different here up at your chest? How does it feel different? <coughs> do you feel a bit of tension there? And the breath out is taking that much longer, isn't it? So what we've allowed to happen inside our lungs there is we've allowed a wee bit of positive pressure to be at the airways. So we're keeping the, the entrance to that airway open. So the trapped air that's in there is just allowed to escape them. We're just letting it last longer so it's coming out. So when people say, I just want that breath in, that's all I want. Actually, what you're helping people to do is get the breath out so that you can have the breath in. So partial lip recovery breathing is, is just a really good way and people lots of people adopt it anyway but it's, it can be quite tricky to actually get over to somebody who who can't do it so it's really good for us to be able to know how it feels as well this is something that we do all the time and we write it down for people so it, and again it's just another way I, again I'm quite visual so I quite like to think of it in terms of that so five minutes yeah we're there okay so we asked them to smell the rose so breathe in through our nose, so smell the rose. And you can imagine that rose in front of you. And then blow the candle. So what I want you to do is, is if you've got a candle flame in front of you and you want to flicker that candle flame, but you don't want to blow it out. If we do, what's going to happen to our flame? We're going to snuff it out, aren't we? We really want that candle flame to flicker. And it's a lovely way just to control that breath out and really allow that air in there to to escape and then we'll get the, the reward of the nice breath in. So smell the rose and blow the candle is something that we, we talk a lot about. And then this one here is probably my favourite because you can just you can use this anywhere. And I know that because I'm not a good flyer and I was on the plane to uh, Barcelona at the weekend and it started getting a bit sugly and I thought, okay, okay, right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to You can do this anywhere. There's rectangles everywhere. The most important thing with this exercise is that our breath in is shorter than our breath out. So remember that the picture of that alveoli, we really want to help all the trapped air that's in here. We want that to, to really come out. And we're going to do that by making that breath out last longer. So, now this is just one that I made up, but there's lots of examples of all over the place. The West Coast where I practice, it's lovely. People have normally got a lovely big picture window that we can look at or, or a picture above their fireplace or something. So everybody's always got something. But we really just want to, to breathe out along the long section and breathe in in the shorter section. So, and it's something that we would ask people to practice when things are good. It's not, this is not going to be learned in an exacerbation, but when things are good, it's going to be one of their tools that we get people to do. And self-talk, you know, we talked about there's um, CBT approaches and that sort of self-talk, so how we start to change behaviour. Sometimes we'll ask people just to simply pat their chest, not to you know, bring their breathing under or slow it down. If they're breathless, they're going to be breathing at a faster rate. But to understand that this is safe, it will pass because it's happened before, they know how to deal with it, they can do that. And so sometimes we'll just ask people just to just to gently pat their chest and say this this will pass. I'm safe. I can do this. I've done it before. I'm doing it now. And actually, just the very act of that and hearing their voices sometimes it's it's enough to to bring that back under control. So this is what some of our people say. They you know they would just would be lost without their fan, or the picture of breathing is is what they like best. I think this is quite poignant, isn't it? Lots of our people say they feel daft because they think it's just panic and anxiety. But actually, when you start to look, we don't have time here to think about the role of adrenaline and driving that panic and anxiety. It's far from just panic and anxiety, isn't it? So it's, it's good to think about that. 
think I just put that slide down because I think we need to just deal with people with kindness, don't we? These people sometimes, or well, certainly the, the folks who I see, have often been in and out of Rigmore or whatever hospital lots of times. Um, so they've had lots of dealings with different people saying it's just panic and anxiety. And so actually a bit of kindness to start to unpack that then, um, as well as looking at their inhaler technique, is always useful. And that's just a link to the Cambridge Breathlessness Society. So thanks for your time. Thank you.